it's recording. And yes, now we'll get started. All right. So, so as I was describing to uh, one person, there was a person back in the corner last class who was evaluating me, and that was for informal feedback, not part of my like, you know, am I a good professor? But um, so one of the things that they suggested, which I'm going to implement, is signposting. So basically telling you where we are in the lecture, what we've covered so far, and do more paste sort of like feedback, meta overview, you know, introspection type stuff. So these are going to be the slides to say like where we are in the class so that you know what's coming and where we were. So hopefully that helps a little bit because I'm fast and when I ask am I fast, I'm like silent feedback. So. <laughs> All right, so the good news is we're halfway through the class, so congratulations, you haven't dropped out yet. Um, <laughs> did everyone bring their memory of what they wrote down at the beginning of the class about um, what, what you wanted to learn in this class? Did, does anyone not have that? We got one. <laughs> okay, two, so three, okay, so four. So, so if there's too many people here who don't have that, we'll try again next week. The objective is um, to review what it is you set out to do at the beginning of this class and evaluate, we're halfway through, are we learning what we wanted to learn? And if the answer is no, then we should recalibrate, right? So it's that sort of pause, reflect, if you need, change behavior, right? So that's, so maybe we'll, <laughs> sorry if you brought it this time, there's four people, like two of them are gonna be missing today, so, I think we'll we'll try again next week. I'll send out a reminder on like Tuesday or so. But please bring your your the thing that you wrote down of your objectives, and then we'll we'll do the recalibration exercise next week. All right. So uh, as I've handed out, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so Rashi's gonna be a little bit late. Rashi's not here tonight, so I'm gonna hand out whoever's done early. I'm gonna give you extra ones. But this is the same thing that we did last time. Um, anonymous peer code review. <laughs> anonymous peer code review, where um, I'm looking for you to give feedback on someone else's homework. And so I want you to. I'll give you some questions that I want you to answer. But basically, write down your observations, right? And this is also not only feedback to them, but for your, for your opportunity to look at someone else's homework and say, huh, that's not how I would have done it, right? Either you did it better, you did it differently, right? Like there's some improvements available. And so this is sort of like a normalization consensus building exercise. It's anonymous, so I've blacked out the names of the people whose homework it is, so please don't try and like de-identify the person. <laughs> but, uh, you know, treat it as someone's homework, who you care about, and you want them to improve, and you want to learn from them. So. Your annotations should go directly on the paper. I printed it out so that you have it to read it, but also to write on it. If you don't have a pen, I'll come around and give you one. Does anyone want to raise your hand if you don't have a pen? Two. Okay, I'll come back to you guys. But um, okay, one. All right. <laughs> so I will come to you. So look at those homeworks. Read them over. They don't all have the output, and so it's sort of like you're the compiler. So. That'll be the challenge for you. Here's what I'm looking for you to write down on the paper. So please write legibly because someone else who's not you will be reading that. <laughs> so take your time to write out in, in sort of legible uh, you know, font these sort of answers. I'll come around with a pen. And we'll take a few minutes. This is a long homework. So some of you guys have up to eight pages, I think was the longest one. You're all grading the fake data exploration task. So the fake data generation. So ideally, everyone's homework should be of about the same length, maybe one or two pages, but there were some of you know, longer length. So uh, And if you have questions while you're reading over the code of like, I don't understand what this does, come ask me, right? That's why I'm here, I'm the instructor. I may or may not know the answer.
When you're done, just raise your hand and let me know verbally that you are done reviewing it. We're going to do a little bit of an exercise after you're done all reviewing it, so I'm not going to collect them this time. Okay. You should each have at least two different homeworks. So there's should be two different authors, two different homeworks. They're all the fake data generation, but they're from two different people. So keep that in mind as you read through them. It's not the same person you're writing two assignments.
Yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep you excited. This one is less likely to be yours. I won't crush my own, but people are finishing it. <laughs> we'll take another maybe three minutes, so we'll finish up when the clock says 7.32. You can keep it. We'll do a little bit more work after.
Okay, another 30 seconds and then we'll finish up and have more adventure. If I don't cover, remind me. All right, so we're going to finish up. So the way that so previously, the exercise was everyone turns in their work to me, and then I have this magic lookup table that just tells you who it is. So the the trick that we're going to play this time is a little complicated. So hopefully everyone has their name tags. No, 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 don't turn it in. That's what I'm saying. So so we're not doing that this time. So make sure that your name tag is by your desk because we're going to use this lookup table. So on everything that you've graded, there is a number associated with a name. That's not the author. So you're not turning the homework that you just looked at to the author. You don't actually know whose it is. This is a little bit of obfuscation that I built in. <laughs> so turn, <laughs> no, <laughs> use the number and the letter A to Deliver it back to the middleman, right? So this is the, the obfuscation layer, is you're not giving it directly back to the author. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You are. Oh, sh <laughs> I think I just it, huh? Yes. Return the uh, assignment back to the person with that letter of my name. And I, I just realized that I screwed that up. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> right, cross oh yeah, perfect timing because we just finished the yeah, exercise. So you should have a, a work paper now. <laughs> you think sits over here. So Middleman exercise, I totally screwed that up. So. <laughs> well, so next time I'll have it worked out. <laughs> oh well. So yeah, read yours over. David, get questions? Huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think that. I, I think we have enough legal advice here that we have. Yeah. The scheme did not work out. Oh well. Yeah, so take a look at it, read it over. Does anyone have questions about the comments that they received? Yes, go. Cool. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I like this. I got that made, and then everything just happened. All right, lesson, write more clearly. So, in the first assignment, there's no specific engagement on how many, like, how many data. So, some people gave you the data. Can everybody listen to this question? Right. You go a little bit louder? Yeah, so the, this assignment, the first assignment, there's no specification on how much data you know, you're generating based on data. So I think that I give you like three different um, the code, and most of them they generate the data manually, like putting the name, you know, like application name, name, name. But what if the um, professor asks us, oh, can you generate like thousand rows of this like, big data? Then we cannot put the name, like thousands of the names. So I'm just wondering, like, yeah. yeah. So, so to, to illustrate her case, so some people have like a list. So her point is, if you have a list of first names and the list of first names is like Ben, Bob, Jack, Mary, right? You can't get a thousand entries from that. What's her claim? Mm -hmm. But I'll dispute you. So there are more than one people named Ben, but they have different addresses. Right? But as long as you're randomly mixing, mm -hmm. it could be a finite list of names. I would argue. So. At the previous lecture, I showed a list from the Social Security Administration of a thousand names. So, if you wanted to generate oh. ten thousand names from that, mm -hmm. you could still do that. It would just have a set of repeats in it, mm -hmm. and the repeats is okay as long as you're not actually repeating the entire row. Mm -hmm. So, I would say you could have a Ben at one address and a Ben at another address, and you could even have two Bens at the same address if they're in different states, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think with the mixing of the different fields, you'd have unique rows even when you're using a finite list. Other questions? No? All right. So these anonymous code review exercises take a lot of work. So what I'm looking for you is feedback if they're useful or not useful. Because the alternative, where we have pairs of you sort of like team up and talk to each other live, that doesn't take any work for me. So <laughs> all right. So the the next. Thing that I'm going to do is a little bit sketchy, and, I'm, and it's taking a lot of risk. So I'm going to look for someone who has solved the other homework assignment. So I'm going to need a, a volunteer, basically. And I need a volunteer who was able to complete the assignment. Let's see, the other one was the uh, Regged CSV. So <laughs> if someone completed the Regged CSV, could you please yeah, raise your hand? Okay. Would you be willing, this is a question that you don't have to say yes to, but would you be willing to explain what you did using the the, the notebook on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yours. Yeah? All right, just take like a minute or two, walk through your thought process. Let's see. I'm going to pull it up, and you can come up to the, the screen if you want to point at things, and I'll even launch it for you, restart and run all. All right. Yeah, if you can just walk us through your process. I think this is your notebook, right? Um, yes. Maybe. Looks like okay. Yeah. Um, but you gave an error on it. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> okay. I think I'm using an older version than you are, but so. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, um, Everyone knows what regex is, right? So uh, I created an inner function uh, within my you know, main function, and I uh, I send a pattern to it, um, and it checks if this pattern matches in line. And if it matches, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not not, it uh, it returns the search. This is mine. 
<laughs> Looks like mine, but I mean, I have one more thing here. Oh, you have a search, yeah, colon. Uh, yes. Break it zero. Let me throw it in. Because I, I, I had to rewrite his code in order to get it to run on my computer. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because uh, it returns, like, you know, if it, if, it, if it matches more than one, it's going to, I think, return all of them. So, like, the first one, like, I want the first one. So, I return that. If not, I return an empty string. Um, can you yep. <clears throat> so in here, I just search the pattern in line. Line is already passed into the function in here, in the main function. So like I mainly encapsulate the logic here. Uh, so like I don't need to repass this line. So for each pattern, it uses line that I passed in up, up top in the main function, and it searched this pattern in that line. If it finds, it's going to turn whatever it found, whatever it found. If not, it's going to return an empty string. Um, actually, I noticed that this is extra, but you know, you can get rid of this. So like, it's going to be even like a linear. So like, you know, this is extra. So um, so each pattern is going to pass in. If it matches, it's going to turn the value. If not, it's going to turn an empty string. And, uh, you messed up my code. <laughs> yeah, I did edit it. If you are using uh, 3.6 or above, there's not there's a nice um, you know convention that Python offers with this. I don't know if you have seen it. So you can directly pass in the variable in here. So it's gonna turn um, on. And so on and so forth, it's going to turn a string, and these values are going to be replaced by replaced with the real values. So, if, when this is this is going to turn one full line, if the value is there, it's going to be the name, phone, or whatever. If not, it's going to be an empty string. So, that mine's not my. Implementation of his code doesn't work because I'm in back in 3.4, so I was editing his code to get it to work. So basically, he takes in the text line, does a string pattern match with all these different patterns, and then when it finds a match, it returns the variable and it prints out the line as it should be, including the empty um, matches. So like if it didn't find the word apartment in the string, then it just returns an empty string. Which is still a placeholder in the CSV. Thank you. So my thought was, you know, if I think there's like ten thousand rows of the data, yeah. and my thought was, I cannot like basically be like look at the, all the data. Correct. And what if the um like the phone number it has like three digits, and right. then there's like slash, and sometimes it could be dot, or it could be just like you know the you know yep. all the digits. And yep. if there's no pattern in there, then how can I yeah. throw it out? Like, yeah. So. So I think your question is, um, when the data is too big, how do you find the anomalies or the outliers or things yeah, that don't matter? Yeah, if uh, even the like phone number or the apartment, and if, if, if it is not consistent, the data, you know, there's times it's not all yep. consistent. How can you do that? <laughs> so the, 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 I guess the advice that I would offer for this one is that you can sort of, usually the errors have a pattern, and that's because this wasn't typed in, like the 10,000 lines here weren't typed in manually. The issue was that the code was generated by a machine, but incorrectly. And so typically the errors that are machine generated have a pattern to them. And so in this instance, the name and the phone number were consistent, but then the address field wasn't didn't have all the things in it that were just supposed to. And that was what the problem was. And so I agree with, like the phone number could have like five digits and then you'd be like, well, I didn't know that that was a problem, right? Because I didn't look through all the data. But often you'll always you'll not always be able to look through all the data. And so, um, in this case, I would say you try and test out the patterns you expect, and you that's why we handled the errors of like if it didn't actually match the fact that the phone number had seven digits. Then you should display that. So that makes sense. So you look for a pattern along your expectations, and when that doesn't match, then report that as an error. So I guess you have to do it like. Spotting on like the pattern within the, the yeah. So you look at the head of your of your table and you see 
okay, from just the snapshot of like 10 rows, I deduce that there's there should be seven numbers and a phone number. And then you write your regular expression to handle that case, and you throw an error if it doesn't match, right? And then you can like you know cruise through the next thousand lines until you hit the one thousand in the one line where there's an error, and then it reports out that error. So you just go with like your hunch, and, and you but you don't fail silently. I guess is the point, right? So like when you have an expectation, and then that expectation is not met because of an anomaly, you shouldn't just say like, oh, never mind. I warned the user, like, oh, yeah, there was an error. All right. So now that memrat has gone, does anyone else want to demonstrate their code? We have one more. That would be super useful. Because I was really hoping to have two people demonstrate working code that's different. Anyone else? One more? All right. So I'll see if I can pick out one that was a little bit different. Let's see. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see if <laughs> some of these are a little bit larger. Let's see. Mm, sorry, I had a quick flux. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this was another attempt uh, that was used to directly read the CSV into pandas. And that typically broke um, because the pandas was thrown off by the fact that the header had four columns in it. And that worked for like the first three lines. But then it broke on the fourth line because that header didn't match up with the row. That was pretty normal. Uh, uh, yeah. Phil, I'm going to steal yours quick. You know, I do not have a memory of what you did, so it might be the same. Yeah, so this was also a regular expressions based of just matching the matching the string pattern expectations based on what he saw. And then um, he has a, a zip file extractor and then opens the file as uh, using read lines. So just because I've been pounding pandas into your head every week doesn't mean that you have to use pandas every time. That's the takeaway message there. So he lo loads in the data as a variable ragged data. And then I'm going to assume loops through yeah, all the entries. So the for loop there is looping over every line in the, in the content and then uh, trying to find a match. And here's his phone number handler. Uh, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> again, Bill's using 3.6 apparently because I'm not. And then throws it in a pandas data frame. So, so this is sort of like what the. I wanted to show some solved ones. There were a lot of people. So when you turn in your pen, when you turn in your Jupyter notebook, the cell execution count is on the left side here. Right? So like this is the fourth cell that was executed. If you go back and execute it again, it increments. So I was seeing notebooks handed to me with like 400 execution count, right? <laughs> Which means a person ran this notebook hundreds of times. So I empathize with how much work that you invested into this uh, project. So I appreciate that. But I do get to see that if you don't clear it out. <laughs> Heads up. All right. I think that's all I have for the homework commentary. I don't have comments or questions on that. I yes, sir. So I started to use, I noticed that the main phone number, you yeah. have uh, all the data there. Mm -hmm. but however, the addresses are having problems. So yeah. I tried to, if the, um, if the, the address has an apartment, yep. has an apartment, yep. and relocate to the to the next column. Mm -hmm. But when I did it, it just cut off the data. It came down to the two thousand something row. So, so, so I think you were sort of selecting on if there was an empty row, then drop that row. That I the, didn't use that. Yeah. But you weren't using the drop row, were you? Uh -oh, no, I wasn't. Yeah. So when I use a log and then like you know it shifted it. It's not putting all the data, so I couldn't like stuck there and then couldn't figure out like what was important. Yeah. Well, if you want to dig through it with me, yeah, email me the notebook. Right. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? All right. I think we'll be able to get through like the first introductory part of the slides here before break. All right. So I had a question from a student who was looking at the the project rubric. Uh, in Excel, 
And the problem is they were only seeing one of the tabs, so they didn't see the um, the tab that said proposal. Did anyone have that issue? I'm trying to figure out. I'm, I'm debugging here with you with the class to figure out. Did you run into anything? It wasn't an issue. Yeah, because that's really. Okay. So I just for for grins and giggles, I will pull up what I see, and then <laughs> because this is important, right? Like I use Excel to communicate with you, and if Excel is not an acceptable tool to use. That's bad, right? So here's here's what I see in Excel is project and proposal. So I've got a head nod there. Anyone else? Did anyone else see two tabs? I did two. Three. Okay, four. All right. So a few people. So about half the class it looks like saw two tabs, and half the class saw one tab. So I don't actually use Excel. This is obviously the web version because I'm using a Mac and I don't have Office installed. So I guess my advice is UMBC online offers Office, and I guess that works. So I apologize if that was confusing. I will probably be more explicit about the fact that it's two tabs next time. Yeah, it just says next to project, it just shows dot, dot, dot. And can you expand the dot, dot, dot? Did you click on that? Oh, yeah. If I click it, it opens. OK. But prior to that, it doesn't look like it's in there. Okay. I have an expectation of why that occurred. All right, that's good to know. <laughs> so this is like personal bias. I'm totally against Microsoft, but I have to use it. So I am sorry if it inflicts pain upon you. All right, so here's where we are with the midterm projects. Today is the official start date of your midterm project. Um, you should look over the rubric so that you know what it is that I'm going to grade you for and what it is that you should be aiming for. What I'm hoping for by October 27th is for you to check in with me via email in person, however you want to accomplish that. But just a check-in right, to see, you know, <laughs> am I going down a useful path? Because if the answer is no, then it's better to correct that you know, before the project is due. So this is a little exercise in customer interaction, right? Because in some sense, I'm your customer, although I'm also sort of the grader. So that's challenging. So, so this is probably the important thing I want to emphasize on this slide is that you should talk to me before you turn in a solution. Like, that's not always what professors do. That's what I do. All right. And then I think, if I recall member correctly, the November 1st is also like the, the next start date for you know, the final exam, because that happens. So. All right. In the report, what I'm basically looking for is reproducibility. If someone, yeah, you had a question? No. OK, so if you have the ability to reproduce the work based on what you've written up and documented, that's that's what I'm aiming for. And it's totally OK to use things you learn in other classes. If you're in 602 and you want to do some machine learning, super. All right. This is my uh, flow chart for I am either you know in one of these states, confused, working on the homework, working on the project, done. Right. This is um, how I think, or I hope that you're thinking. And so this is when you come to me when you're confused or stuck. All right. <laughs> I've been saying it over and over and over. All right. So this is like a fun observation that I had no idea what to think. And so I did some math. <laughs> so four of 15 people use the same data set. That's interesting. All right. 26% of the class, that's pretty high. So, so then I said to myself, what are the odds, right? <laughs> so let's do the math. So there's 53 data sources that I listed in Blackboard. That's um, quite a few. So let's look at the math. Uh, we can do that. And pull up a notebook. All right, so the way that I did this is basically back to lecture three where we did the math. And so I wanted to do uh, 100,000 experiments where I rolled a 53 sided die, right? That's like you trying to figure out which data source should I use. I, I use a 53 sided die, and I run that 15 times, right? So each experiment is rolling that die 15 times. And the question is, how often do I get back 
four outcomes that are the same, right? So I could have the 53 sided die rolling one, 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 right? And, and whatever the other values are, but I wanted to match four times, right? So match count four. And so I did that. And so out of 100,000 uh, experiments of that design, then I got back 742 times, you got four um, numbers that were the same. Does that explanation make sense? So therefore, the you can say that the percentage of getting all four cases being the same for 15 students with 53 options was 0.74%. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so what I was really aiming for with it, so this is this is my my takeaway from this is that uh, let's see. I think people were actually trying to aim for a hypothesis that's true, right? Like I wanted to make a statement that it's gonna I'm gonna you know gather evidence for and it's gonna turn out to be true. That's actually defeating the purpose of why we do research, right? In research, a good measure of whether you're successful is if you fail half the time, right? So <laughs> the, the fun part there is um, knowing how much you know and knowing the unknowns is <laughs> really the challenge, right? Because if you only report things that are true, <laughs> no one cares, right? Like they all know, you know, this folklore is valid and therefore that's why we use the story. Right, and and if you go off and numerically validate that, well, you're just reporting obvious conclusions, right? The more exciting part of hypothesis testing and sort of like making testable claims is when someone makes a statement about the folklore of their environment, and then you go numerically demonstrate that they're wrong, right? That's cool. <laughs> so having a hypothesis that you expect to be true and ends up being false is often the most exciting because it breaks the new ground, right? It shows that the hypothesis, the, the folklore was wrong. So the important thing there is that the analysis should be valid so that you're really backed up by the data. I think that's all I wanted to convey with that, is that aiming for things that are consistently true in your hypotheses is useless. So you should take risk, right? But not too much risk. All right. So the other question that I got back quite a bit on the, on the proposals, and we'll take a break here uh, momentarily because it's been an hour, um, was that some of these data sets are really, really big. And so the immediate reaction from, from y'all was like, I'm only going to use the first 5,000 rows. OK, well, we haven't actually shown that you need to subsample your, your data set. Um, and that's probably also not the right way to do it. So if you take the first 5,000 rows of 100,000 row data set, you might get some biased data if someone kindly sorted the values for you, right? So like if we sorted alphabetically or like by region or something, and you only go with the first 5,000, that's going to get you a biased sample. So one of the things there to take away is if you do end up needing to sample, you should really do sort of like a random sampling from the data set, which is effectively sort of shuffling the rows. And that sort of hopefully removes the risk of some bias in your sampling. And then uh, you can also just even tell how many rows to sample from rather than a percentage. But um, yes, yeah, so the, the, the main point that I made to everyone who suggested this was that you have to first show that computationally it's necessary to subsample. Right? So if you just go off and say, well, I'm only using the first five rows. Well, why did you do that? Right? Why not just throw all of your computer, which is really powerful, at all of the data? And then if your computer breaks, then we go back and we, we, we get a little bit lower. Questions on? I think those are really straightforward, so we haven't actually learned anything yet. But. So don't sample your data unnecessarily. And then we'll take a break. I'll be back at 8.05. All right, break time. Yes. So we did an analysis in particular notebook, right? Yep. I remember you said, like, you made it, like, a free notebook. Mm -hmm. For the midterm? Yeah. Just one. Oh, just one? Okay. And then for the... So you were supposed to submit two proposals. Oh, two. One, one primary and then a backup if the first one fails. Oh, okay, got it. And that, so um, if for the uh, visualization, do I use a Jupyter notebook or use other tools? Jupyter. Oh, Jupyter notebook. Okay, yes. got it. But there's no limit well, <laughs> so my objective is to tell a story, 
And so uh, the visual, like yeah. doing random visualizations just because they're pretty, yeah. that is a tactic that people use as distraction, but it's distraction from a story. And so I would argue that it's not, so I would say it's not a bad thing to explore the different visualizations that exist, but in the end, you want to make clear which ones are your story. Okay. So let's say I'm presenting like six different so I would say have a purpose for each, okay. each one, right? And yeah, yeah. and the ordering sometimes matters because like yeah. maybe there's a logical flow, but sometimes it's just like I did this and I did this and I did this and they're all independent, so it doesn't matter as much. Okay. Do you have like because I want to ask you about my corner? Okay. Um, okay. Do you have a uh, time after class? Because yeah. I'm running to the bathroom. Yeah, sure. <laughs>
is good to know. That's probably my guess when they do your act. It's like a breed. I want to get it. So, like, typically the data access patterns are the things that are costly, or if it's only like a random library over and over and over and over, because it's only once. Those are things that you have to sort of start asking for where it's going to be. Yeah. Data access patterns. So that's because appending another row to your data frame is memory intensive. That's actually like reallocate everything. So it rebuilds it every time you're adding new row. And so there are more efficient ways to do that same task. Okay. Your blue shirt, I should see your blue shirt. All right. So there's a little bit of bias in, in this lecture towards sanity checks because that's what kills me the most. So when I go talk to customers, the customers typically understand their data better than I do. And that really makes me in a fearful state because it's the consequences that they can figure out whether my analysis is wrong faster than I can. And so it's really embarrassing as a data scientist who has spent months on a project to walk up to a customer and say, here's the results I got, right? And they're like, that's wrong. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> and so I'm going to be emphasizing sanity checks a lot because they're the things that the customers know to look for that can catch you off guard if you're not aware of even what they are. Okay. Shoot. Um, when you get data in general, before you do the analysis, do you go in do some specific Absolutely. So, so, so my I have my approach is to be as interactive with the customer as possible. So like before I get the data, once I've gotten the data, before I do the cleaning. So like every time I'm checking in with them. But some customers are less available than others. And so like typically the higher up you are in an organization, the less available you are. And so if the person high up in the organization is the person who gave me the data and wants the results. And they're not always available. That check-in process is difficult. Yeah. And so, typically, the more sensitive the data is to the organization, the higher up the person who has the authority to release it. Uh, so, what I'm hoping that is you'll be able to talk about these uh, content in a little bit more detail after tonight. And this is just what I said. Um, make sure that the data is relevant to your customer before you clean it, because you're going to invest effort in making sure the data is readable and that it makes sense. And it takes a lot of sort of creativity. And if you end up with a really clean data set that is useless to your customer, you just wasted your time. So just that's that's reinfor reinforcing that sort of customer check-in mentality. Like, and then so I have a little shout out to the fake data, right? Because that's where you get um, results before you even have data. So the lazy approach is just like throw your data in pandas and start doing analysis, right? And that will invariably lead to wrong results because there's something wrong with your data. And so what I am sort of prepping your mindset for is like when should I look for sanity checks, right? And the answer is before you even start doing the analysis. Like you know, if you plot the data and there's something wrong with it, like that's a good hint, but you should be very careful about the correctness of your data. And as I was mentioning, like you have to go back and forth, and it's not just sort of like make sure it's all clean, then do your analysis, right? It's not a two-step process. It's like sanity checks, start the analysis, find something wrong, go back to the sanity checks, clean the data more, go back to your analysis. It's back and forth over and over and over, and so it's hopefully by the time you come back to your customer and say like here's my final results, you've done enough of those iterations with your sanity checks. And this. <laughs> So this is like, how have I gotten burned as a data scientist, right? It's because I wasn't skeptical about the data itself. And so <laughs> if you can, these are sort of like the soft questions. We'll get into the hard sort of technical questions later. 
But if you can just talk to the person who generated the data, that's almost always the easiest because they'll be able to explain to you, oh yeah, we had to make this little shortcut over here because we didn't know what to do with it. Oh, that's why it's bad, right? So talking to people is super useful as far as figuring out the validity of your data. And then sort of like understanding the whole data life cycle before it reaches you, also super important. How is the data collected? How is it processed? How did someone sort of understand what to do with it before they gave it to you? Um, and if they're sloppy, the data is going to be wrong, right? So when you start talking to someone, are they using precise language? Do they know what they're talking about? Or are they just sort of like, oh, yeah, you can do that, like, like right? <laughs> Listen for that, because in their tone of voice and the way in which they speak, they will convince you of whether or not the data may or not, may or not, I mean, not be good. And then sort of like, this goes into the, does it make sense, right? Is it plausible? I don't know, hopefully. All right. We've already covered half the content. No. <laughs> All right. So these are just sort of like I'm going to present to you a bunch of obvious things, and I apologize because they're obvious. But on the other hand, the reason I'm presenting to you is because I see this stuff um, in practice, and so <laughs> like this is a candy bar, and there are expensive candy bars, and they're probably overpriced. But you know, when they're they're a numerical value that's not within a reasonable range, start questioning your data. And then sort of the, the little more nuanced things of like the bus stop, you know, picked up people between these times. Well, those are times, right? And, and there's nothing wrong with the data format, so we can proceed. Well, no, you should apply the fact that, you know, buses arriving within seconds of each other over the course of, you know, you know, these are things that might not be obvious if you don't sort of like start to think and be like, wait a minute, that wasn't right. So. <laughs> These aren't just sort of like accidents that show up. They're they're caused by something, and so it's worth digging into. Well, how did those bus stop times get collected, right? Or did someone sort of like fat finger in something? Or really common, they'll take a, a time and then they'll like copy paste it and then forget to go back and fix that, right? So you can see some some sort of narrowness in your variance due to copy paste errors. It's pretty common. All right. <laughs> if you see this one, and it's like time. And the units for time is horses, and you have a fractional value. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with that data, right? So typically, you'll get back some units associated with your variables, and those should align with the data type, right? So like this column makes sense, but this one does not. So again, how do you tell a machine to do this, right? I think this is really where the humanness comes in of data science, because I can't figure out how to get computers to know that that's wrong. Maybe I'm just not creative enough. So when will data scientists know when a computer can figure out that that doesn't make sense? <laughs> so in the, in the top column, just to clarify, that's like the variable, yeah. right? The second uh, sorry, row here is the units, right? And so then you have your, your values here. And so in some sort of sense, everything is acceptable to a computer, right? These are units. But if you think uh, from a human perspective, this column doesn't make any sense. Well, both. So the fact that we don't measure time in horses, right? That's not a valid unit. I thought there was like typo, time in hours. Well, so yeah, there could be a typo there. Oh. That's reasonable. That's that's a very good troubleshooting approach, right? Like, what's the nearest sort of approximation to that wrongness? <laughs> But then, like whether or not 4.2 is a reasonable time independent of the units, you know, maybe, maybe not. That's a, a good analysis, by the way. <laughs> All right. So then, um, again, sort of the, the humanness of data science of like which values do not make sense at all, right? Um, back to my fixation on animals with fractions, uh, 4.28 cows. Right? That may or may not make sense in your context. <laughs> if you're a slaughterhouse, I guess. <laughs> All right. And then more typically, you'll see percentages that exceed 100%. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, this is more common, I think, because people don't understand what percentages are. <laughs> but a case where this might actually be legitimate is where you have like a growth factor, right? Like we grew by 150%. In some sense, that makes sense. Because it's really just saying we grew by a 1.5x over where we were. So that's acceptable. But that's not the case in, say, the story where 
I'm counting the number of chapters in a book. So again, I don't know how to make this automated, so you just have to look through the values. All right, and then um, sort of patterns that shouldn't be there, right? If I, if I have a bunch of people and they're only aged in the decade bins, that's highly unusual, right? Maybe it's a convention of the decade aged age people, but <laughs> this is an indicator that maybe someone was lazy or maybe they're off by a factor of 10. I mean, like one, two, three, four makes sense, but 10, 20, 30, 40 is less likely. All right, so, this is, so all of these are just sort of like signposts that there's something wrong with your data. All right, sometimes variation is good and sometimes it's not. So things that vary over time, you should expect them to vary over time, right? So like the temperature of your body in this case, something that you would expect to vary. And at an advantage, you know what the frequency, uh, the, the period of that oscillation is. So whether it's 24 hours, or maybe it's seasonal every three months, or maybe it's annual every 12 months. There are patterns that you should look for um, that, that you should expect to see based on whatever the variable is. All right, brainstorm time. Let's see if I have a pen. All right, so you're going to shout out to me, and I'm going to write on the board uh, what sanity checks we would have for text, because I've been focused a lot on numerical data. So what kind of things would you First off, what text variables would you expect to see? So, so categorical, sure. Right. What's a what's a text variable that is on your name tag, by the way? Your name. <laughs> That's a text variable. Are there other text variables that you're familiar with? <laughs> city, awesome. All right, so like a, a person name, and like a city. So a location, maybe more generally. All right. I would consider maybe like a, the address, right? The thing that you did on your homework, that's a text variable. All right, so now we've enumerated some of them. So what sort of constraints for these variables would you expect? Yes, Rachel. Good, OK. So uh, letters only? OK. So, so hyphens and letters. Okay, so maybe a, a length constraint. Okay. So the funny thing is to me that you are paying to be here, I'm being paid to be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So it should have accent? Okay. Um, I'm trying to like figure out how to raise the green. Uh, accents. Okay. Will I agree? We will actually get into that more. Yes. Yes, sir. Made of the name, the last name, first name. Okay, so maybe a limit on the number of strings in a list? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sort of list length limit, I'll we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Josephine? Awesome, loving it. So sort of a geographic restriction on location, right? So perfect example, the state of Mexico. You don't have actually a state of Mexico, it's a country. All right. 
Okay. So same same sort of constraints there of like length limit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So perfect. So there are in fact constraints on what I would expect to see in text data. I'll cover a couple of those. So I think you hit um, on these that the for example, in a street address, I can't think of any numerical street address which doesn't have numbers in it, or it has more than numbers in it. So like the street address 59 at 4, I don't know where to deliver the mail. Right? And you've already mentioned the special characters and the names. And then sort of a categorical issue of like, you'll see misplaced data. Right? So we, we saw that actually in the homework with the regular CSV of if you have something that's in the wrong category, it just doesn't fit the pattern of what you're looking for. And then we'll have like the back to the categorical data, whoever suggested that. Thank you very much. Because yes, no cats. I just don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> that is my three options. Um, and then list elements, sort of a repeating pattern here of like back to the, the state of Mexico. It doesn't actually exist. And then certainly the if 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 you have the number of days in a week as a list and it's nine, you're wrong. Right. Monday, Tuesday, one, seven days, not nine. All right. <laughs> and then this is always a joy of like someone hands you what they claim to be XML, but it actually contains JSON. Well, that's inaccurate, right? It's the wrong format. And then really screw is if you try and open a binary, I don't know if you ever really have played with this, but if you try and open a binary file and it's uh, treated as text, it just doesn't work out very well. So these are the, the things that I wanted to brainstorm with you. All right, and then the, the rare categorical entries, we've already seen that this semester with this little snippet of code where uh, we can pick out, you know, sorted by the number of um, entries. And so what this code does is it reports the most frequent entries in a column for categorical data. But you could flip this head value to be tail, and it would report the least common categorical variables. And so if you had that yes, no, supposedly binary column, but there was yes, no for, say, 500 entries, and then there was like a single entry of cat. You'd actually want to see the bottom of that list of categories. All right, so then the question is like, well, OK, so we found a problem. <laughs> You're not done. So what it means is you can either try and figure out, is this some sort of rare exception that we should handle, or is it more of a, a sort of infrastructure issue where Maybe the collection methodology was wrong, right? And sometimes it makes sense to fix the all errors, but sometimes you actually it makes more sense to go back to the source and say, hey, the way in which you're collecting data or generating it is wrong. Because if you are invariably trying to fix data that was broken upstream of you, that's sort of a losing battle because it's always going to be broken when it gets to you. So it's just like a nice courtesy to fix the upstream problems, even though it's not in scope for your data science work. Be a good citizen of your organization. <coughs> All right. <laughs> so this is a, a lesson that my advisor imparted to me. You know, one to infinity. So what does that mean? So one instance of a problem, that's a mistake. Two instances of that problem, we should start looking for a pattern. Right. So the pattern hopefully extend out, but <laughs> that's sort of the breakpoint for me is if you just see the problem once, maybe we can ignore it. If you see it twice, uh, we should start digging into that. All right, and then some other sort of like observations here. The, <laughs> the distribution of a variable before and after cleaning should be consistent. So if your cleaning ends up making something that's sort of like shaped like some uh, non-uniform distribution, then like you reshape it, and oh, it's uniform. Well, you actually just changed um, how your data is interpreted. And then, there's never a right choice. Like unless you're like violating some statistical principles of math, you you have some subjective leeway. So so if I look at, so let's say I look at the ages of students in this class, right? And this is somehow shaped around this, right? Or this is, I don't know, 25. 
under the SIDS account. And so uh, there's a few enough, few of us in here. There's, there's like what, 17 people? And this, there's this, some outliers here, right? Up at this far end of the spectrum. And so if we say those people are the noise, right? And we'll just get rid of them. The shape of my distribution looks much cleaner, right? So I, I've sort of like cleaned up the shape of my data, but we've actually lost the relevant data in that there are old people in this class. Does that make sense? So you, you, the goal is to eliminate the noise and keep the signal. But it's awfully easy to figure out, you know, that when it's some clear story, less so when you don't know what the data story is in the first place. So if you go around sort of changing the shape of your variable distribution for a given variable, your story might end up being wrong. Does that answer the question? So it really comes down to us. Stick with, I'm, I'm sorry to be picking any old people in this class, but you know who you are. <laughs> so, so the question is like, what is the, so the story determines what your uh, signal is, right? And so what, that's why it's, so, so there's not a right choice because the question of like, what is the threshold for noise depends on what the story is that you're telling. So if you're trying to say the average age of a student at UMBC is, maybe it makes sense to throw out the outliers, right? Because they're sort of like, skewing the distribution older, right? But in the, in the sense of like, sometimes you actually do care about what is the oldest and youngest student we have, well, then your story really shouldn't throw out those data points. And so what is relevant depends on the story you're trying to tell. Does that capture it? Okay. All right, so yeah, it's basically, the point here is there's a lot of subjectivity even though um, you're trying to apply some math and programming skills, which are hopefully not as subjective. And that the most important point to me is that regardless of whatever choice you make, you should be very clear and explicit to your audience about how it is that you got to the result that you did and why you thought that was the right process. Because if you don't, if you just say like, ah, here's the result, well, was that the, all the data? Like, you know, so most customers won't question you on your process unless they're, they've been around the block a few times. And so it's important just to be very explicit about this is how I got to the result. Uh, yeah, that also aims back to uh, reproducibility. All right, so we finished up on sanity checks. Basically, these are all those are the, the highlights of the things that we discussed. Um, so <laughs> each one of these, I didn't sort of like cruise around the internet looking for them, it turns out. It just came from my experience. And then I verified that those were, that there wasn't anything else that I missed. So <laughs> this is coming from my experience. And I apologize if that uh, isn't in your book, but that's what I've learned. So I think I didn't miss anything in your book, but. All right. All right. Outliers. So I think. We'll take uh, 15 minutes to the next break. So we got enough time to do another section here. The, the story here is, um, you may or may not have seen this, depending on how much text you've been cruising around in. And so the, the story here is like, if you have some characters that are not in your normal standard English text, the rendering of that by your computer may occasionally screw up. So not so big of a deal if you're not actually sort of interested in this part. But so sometimes you can get away with it. But there are sort of like harder to decode things visually of like, well, are those really close to each other? Not really. But the big question is, why does this happen? And so the answer is it's because it's how computers render text. So in your computer, stored away, hidden locked away, is all the lookup tables for the things that we look at in terms of ones and zeros. And so in this case for what it's called ASCII, the A-S-C-I-I, -I, um, that is uh, for a given character, a code in your computer. And so what we see is not what the computer thinks in terms of. And so this is a convention basically that we humans have established and agree to when sharing data but it's not the only convention. 
So there are other conventions available for other text files. So this ASCII text is great if you're an English-speaking country and you only care about standard characters in this limited set. But if you speak a different language, which has different characters, <laughs> do you guys want to comment on something? Oh, well, there's a little sticker there that says languages such as Japanese and Arabic without different characters. Uh, that's not true for Arabic. OK. How many? <laughs> well, they have, they have an alphabet. OK. So no characters. Hmm. It's like Hebrew, right? But the single, single sort of right, right. So there's a block. consonants and dots and vowels. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I would like maybe Japanese and Chinese you could do that. <laughs> right, any character. So the complexity here is that <laughs> there are things that are we want to represent on the computer that don't fit into this, you know, A B C D type character string. So there's multiple different conventions. And so if the file that you've encoded is in a different convention than you expect, then you'll see all the garbage uh, of this previous slide. So this is someone trying to read text with the wrong encoding scheme. Okay. So there's some, some really good stories behind this. So I highly recommend reading the Joel on software entry. Basically, the problem that he ran into was they were relying on some very standard software to read data. And that standard software didn't handle foreign characters outside of the ABCD that you're used to. And so trying to have other people fix those very you know, fundamental libraries was hard because people in the United States who develop the software are biased towards thinking that everything is ABCD, EFG. So that's, that's a, a problem um, depending on the software you're using. All right, so in Pandas, back to what we care about, um, basically the trick is to choose the appropriate encoding for the text that you're given. And there's a, a library. So you can sort of like guess at this and see if it works. And there's few enough of them usually that it works. There's also a, a module called character detection cardet that will show you or try to guess what the, the encoding is. So the full list of there's, I don't know, like 70 encodings that I could find on this page. So that's a lot. All right, now we're gonna do some demos. The demos are maybe the exciting part for this lab, this lecture. So Zip's Law. So last time, so that's all I have on coding. Is anyone else? <laughs> you guys have anything? All right. Let me get back to this. Six. All right, so if you remember from last week, we were getting the, the data from the essays that you guys wrote. Um, and so I, I threw all of the content from your essays into a single file, this pickle file. Ooh, all right. So all of your documents that you wrote are in this one file, and these are the, the sources of them. And then basically, I had to go through all of the data and clean it up. So this is just a snapshot of the first little line of text. And then I threw all of the content to be lowercase using that. Now you can see the change there to be lowercase. And then I split all of the content on spaces, which yields a list of 7,000 words. That's all the words from all the essays. And if you use a set, you can get the number of unique strings in that list. So the number of unique words used by all of your essays is just 1,800 words. With me so far? That's all of the things that you guys have written so far in your submitted essays. And then I had to throw that into ASCII so that I got rid of all the special characters. And then that threw out. Uh, like 400 of them. Let's see. All right, so not so, this is just like a sanity check, right? The most frequent word used in your essays is the. That, that's not surprising. 
So the reason I checked for it is because it's not surprising. So if I got back something else, like say Bob, now we've got a problem. All right, so if we can go even fancier, we can say the top words as ranked, right? That's pretty cool because what it means is data shows up it's the second most option, most oftenly used word. That's great. And science shows up in that top 10 list also. All right, so let's see, where do we go next? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I want to look at the bottom just for sanity checking of like what's at the bottom of the list. All right. Then we filtered all the words. Um, oh, yeah. So we got rid of all the, the stop words. So now data, data and science are the top one and two entries, and Python is the third. So that's totally sensical because we got rid of all the words like the. All right. So now, now, out of my curiosity, this was, at the time, me just sort of playing around with the data. And so I wanted to do a histogram of that list of words, right? So like the top 10 entries, it's sort of easy to rationalize why that is there. But just for fun, let's see what that number, that, that distribution looks like as a histogram. So the most, uh, the word that shows up the most frequently showed up like almost 800 times. And then there was a bunch of words which showed up much less frequency. Right, so from a visualization story, this is a crappy diagram, right? Because it uses almost no ink, right? It's got like this huge spike and empty space, totally useless from a from a sort of like understanding perspective. So my natural reaction is to make this scale uh, a logarithmic rather than linear, in order to sort of draw out that story of like where are those where are those words, so. It gets a little better. You can sort of like start to see the curve there. But we can do one better. We can make, so this axis here is pretty sparse on, on this axis. So we'll do the same thing. We'll apply a, a log axis here. So now we've got a log log axis where this is stepping by increments of 10, and this is stepping by increments of 10. And now we have something very exciting. <laughs> this exciting to me, anyways. So this is called a power law distribution. When you have a log log axis with a straight line on it, that means there's a power law distribution. So <laughs> the the exciting part of that is so the log when I say log log it means that the equation of that slope is x to the a single value. And so the the consequence of this is what we've discovered is Zipf's law. There's actually a a Wikipedia entry, which goes through this, but basically it says the most frequent word in a language shows up, you know, ten times as often as the next frequent word, and so like there's this distribution of how often a word shows up in use, and your text just showed that. Right? This is this is your text with all of your essays, and it occurs um, according to this power law distribution. That means <laughs> that. We could apply this to other languages and get back the same result. So we just came up with a test to determine whether or not this is written in a language. OK, so it's not that big of a surprise. Like, yes, you're using English, so I'm glad that we rediscovered that. But the exciting part is we could apply the same logic to other species. <laughs> Woo! Right? <laughs> Do animals communicate? You just measure it, right? That's pretty straightforward. What's the bias? No, 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 no. So, so we assume. So, this is now we're striving off data science. We're in information theory. So, information theory basically says that if there's information traveling between two entities, you can measure and determine the density of that data. So that's basically what I just did. And so <laughs> this is sort of where that's going, is that you can look at communication patterns between other animals. We use words, either written or verbal, right? And so it means if you recorded your audio, you could take out how often those little audio snippets occur, and it would, occur, it would uh, uh, apply to Zip's law, right? So that 
um, that same pattern would show up. And the slope of that is basically the information density. And so if you have a very like, you know, baby type talk, it's a different slope than how adults communicate. And so you can measure the density of the communication pattern. And you can say like a dolphin is as old as like a two year old or something like that. So, so this, so why do I care, right? Back to data science. So the reason is because if you look at your text document, if someone hands you 10,000 text documents and you're like, I can't read through these, I'm not even sure they're written in English, right? Or some other language, right? You actually don't need to read all of them. You can apply this word count analysis and figure out is there intelligible communication in these documents? Woohoo! <laughs> Right, so we just came up with another sanity check for, for text. <laughs> yeah, y'all aren't information to do it. All right, cool. Um, you got to in the opposite to the actual text. So I'm not sure. Right, so. So I have not looked for this, but I think what you're saying is so human languages of the same say topic and the age level and complexity should be the same slope in different other language. So I don't know whether that's been applied to code or computer communication. But like you use that Very reasonable question. Do do the computer communication patterns adhere to Zip's law? And at what level? <laughs> it's a measurable thing. Googleable probably even. All right. So I just showed you sort of like a, a high level sort of word based counting approach. Now we're going to go off and, and show another different crazy thing. All right. That was. All right, so we just showed that we can sort of detect languages. We can also look for anomalies in text um, at the letter level. So again, I'm using your same essays. So I'm going to not spend as much time walking through the same uh, process. But the idea is that you can pick out from that text corpus all of the letters that are used. Right. So what do we do with that? Well, let's look at a histogram. So the histogram shows us from that huge distribution, and I've normalized along this axis to count. Um, so this is sort of like an order of what the first string was. So what I did was I reordered that axis to show the most entries and the least on the right. And so Z and Q and J are less frequently used. And E and T and A are frequently used. So this is another diagnosis tool that you can say, do these adhere to an English type text? Or are the character sets written in some other language which has a different frequency distribution for the characters? So back to your language detection, if that's what you're asking, this would be the way you check that. Different languages have different frequencies. All right, so these are all standard approaches to figuring out what your content is without having to actually read it. And if you see an anomaly, like, you know, if you expect E to be the most frequent language or most frequent character because it's English and it's somewhere down here, then something's wrong, right? And so by knowing in your, this is me helping you build your intuition of what you should expect from your data. So if you see your data in text and it's not according to Zip's law, and the letter frequency is off, right? It means that there's something wrong with your text. All right. And then, let's see, I got one more slide before break time. All right. This is to me like one of the craziest ones. All right. So what we looked at so far is words, and we looked at the letters, but we can also look at the numbers for anomalies. So let's see if I can. It's already ran. So what I'm loading is some loan data, loan applications. You know, people looking for money. 
And this is a, a relatively large data frame. It's got 42,000 rows, 145 columns, right? Pretty big. Um, and so we look at this, and I, I've flipped the table so the, the columns are on this axis so you can sort of see what's going on a little easier. But basically, we've got, you can read this off, right? Loan amount, $5,000, $2,500, $2,400. Member ID, they didn't apparently have one. How much of that loan amount was uh, serviced? And then, you know, how long was the loan for? All these good things that you care about, right? And so we're going to get rid of uh, a couple of columns. And we'll come back to that. We clean that up. And, and so what we look for is, get down to the important part here. All right. So from the loan amount, what we wanted to figure out was, what is the frequency of a one being the first character? And what's the frequency of two being the next cut of the first character? Right? And so it's looking at the first character distributions. And your na naive intuition might be all of those digits should show up uniformly since they're sort of random variables, right? 42,000 loans. But it turns out one is the most frequent first character in a number. That should surprise you, right? <laughs> it's not intuitive. And so the other numbers, two, shows up second most often, and the other ones are sort of like flat distribution. So that's that's another thing that you can look for. And this has been actually widely used. So when people make up data, they're typically not aware of Benford's law. And it's a little hard to make up data that adheres to Benford's law. And so <laughs> if you're looking for someone who's like messing with the data, the first test you apply is Benford's law. Now you can make up more realistic data. <laughs> right. So so this is just like a, a, a warning of like if you're suspicious, there are tests to apply statistically to see if the data adheres to the right pattern. All right, and with that, I think we will take a break. Break job. And we can come back at 5853. I'm wondering if I turn the lights on, other people will be annoyed. Yeah. Can we try turning the lights off? The lights off. Yeah, the lights off. Yes. <laughs> 
number for each oh, right. like, you know, digit was the new one. I mean, that was, I've seen some lines, like, that was, like, for, like, you know, data science studio, yeah. like, to see, like, you know, I don't know what that. That, I don't know, like, there, there is media in that number. Like, not, I think that's the last one. If you we're going to get sort of started. Alice, so we're going to get started. All right. So the lights are on. Hopefully, you're more awake. <laughs> Change your environment for you. All right. So, out of all the things that I've told you, None of those are popular things to talk about as a data scientist. And I apologize for wasting all your time because that's where I spend most of my work. But um, where people make a lot of money and spend a lot of concern is on time series analysis. And the reason for that is typically back to the question of predictive analytics. Um, you typically want to be able to predict an anomaly. right? And an anomaly in a time series sense is different than sort of like a static set of data. And so this is a pretty straightforward sort of understandable plot of you have some variable that evolves over time, and there's some variance to it, right? And that is sort of bounded by these uh, safety ranges. Um, but what you really care about is this region where it's wandering away from the norm, right? And so in this specific case, it's pretty straightforward to do that. So um, back to Esther's question about, do we actually need mach you know, machine learning and predictive analytics? The answer is no in this case, right? Because for this data set, I can simply draw a lower threshold, and I can draw an upper threshold. I'm not a machine learning person. I just did things that are useful for predictive analytic. Because the predictive analytic in this case is, if that value wanders outside of my human-defined safety ranges, it's bad. Does that answer your question about predictive analytics? Mm -hmm. uh, so so <laughs> this is what I call like the dumbest first thing you should do. A lot of people get hyped into, like, we have to collect data, and we have to apply machine learning, and the answer is, no, you don't. Right? So the reason you don't is because a lot of time, a human is good at coming up with some arbitrary threshold that is meaningful. Right? Arbitrary in the sense of you just drew it. Meaningful in the sense of if it exceeds that threshold, it's bad. Okay, so this is so simple, it almost never happens. But when it does, you should totally exploit the fact that you don't need machine learning. Right? All right. <laughs> There's some more complexity, but we can get over that too, right? So like, there's things that should always be within some bounds, but then there's other signals that are sort of periodically varying based on either the season or the time of day or the time of the week, right? Like maybe Amazon gets more sales on the weekends, we don't know, right? But they should allocate their servers based on that fluctuation. So there are some, some fluctuations. You can't just always assume everything's nice and even. All right, this one's a very nice, uh, snapshot of the current state of the art, I would say, about like the a test people apply to the time series anomalies. But just to, to reemphasize, basically, any sort of anomaly detection and discarding that you do, you have to be able to justify. If you can't say why you did it, then you probably shouldn't do it. All right. and, and this trust here is trust with respect to you, the data scientist, and the people that you're selling the story to. If they don't have a reason to understand why what you did is reasonable, they're not going to buy it. All right. Next sort of walkthrough that we'll look at is this. Right. That opens up. So what we've talked so far is about the numerical data, sanity checks. We've talked about text data. And then um, this is a little bit of a sidebar on visual data cleanup. Right? So if I've got a lot of data and I don't know how to tell that story well, this web page is really good for um, walking through different variations you can make on it. Right? So they've got about I don't know, eight different sort of methods of displaying that same data, but much more meaningfully. So we'll go through and just like, you can play with all these different basically tweaks. So here's a sampling example of the threw away a bunch of data, but the story remained because they randomly sampled that data. But there's tons of other techniques. So I'm going to allow you to cruise through here. And basically, whether one of these is more meaningful than the other, it's totally subjective. 
And it depends on your audience, right? So like I would argue this one, this is a lot more of a cognitive burden for your audience to understand what this data is telling them compared to say something like this, right? So like this is a pretty straightforward, there's three things and their sort of variation is that much, right? And this is the exact same data, I would argue it's a higher cognitive load to sort of see what that data is. So again, if you have questions about which is appropriate, it sort of depends on knowing your audience. Sometimes, like, this is a, a, what I call a dark pattern, a bad thing to do. If you're using this, it can distract your customers. Sometimes that's desirable, right? Sometimes you're like, look at the pretty colors, right? And if that's your audience's need, they want to see pretty colors, <laughs> you just fed them the thing they want. Right. I, I advise against doing that because typically, so the competitive environment is, Suppose you've got a report and you give it to someone who is interested in pretty colors, right? And your competitor also hands them a report. And it is, say, a little more factual, right? Like this. Like this also has colors. <laughs> well, if you know your audience, right, maybe the, the, the more factual one isn't actually the one that's going to get the grant, right? And so, again, <laughs> I, I, it breaks my heart, right? It's morally ambiguous about whether this is acceptable. It is an accurate representation of the data, but you know, know why you're using it. For me, just by the way, if you're presenting to me, I'm into that one. I'm not the pretty colors guy. All right. And then this is so good, I didn't even bother stealing it. We'll just go there. Oh, no. All right. Go, no. There'll be a slight musical interlude while we find them. Just cleaned up my data. All right, so the argument being made in this uh, website as a graphic here. So they start out with this really fancy diagram, and they basically like start removing everything. And they're going through sequentially all the different things that they're removing. And we'll see this again as it loops. But basically, the argument they're making is the less information you present, the more precise and concise your story, right? So like, we're just saying, like, what's the focus, right? What should our reader be drawn to? And again, this is a visual cleanup process because informationally speaking, they end up with the same result. But the way in which the story gets told is drastically different, right? This picture versus that one way different visually, even though informationally it's the exact same thing. So I see people with too much time on their hands who want to like make a flashy thing get stuck on that first slide, whereas in the end maybe the story that you want to tell is just more about the data and you can be very, very concise. So <laughs> I'm not sure how to like reemphasize that for you, but hopefully this is a very visual demonstration that shows you your every step losing noise, right? And this is clutter in your visualization. So if you can drill down into what's important, that's very useful. Right. And it, so there's a whole Edward Tuft like rant on, on why that is important. So we'll not subject you to that. All right, this is a little pro tip. When you're cleaning up your data, if you need to rename your columns, totally do that, it's a good idea. All right, so smoothing your data. This is uh, now we're approaching the end, so it's good timing. So smoothing your data basically is going back to that same idea of separating your signal and your noise. The thing you care about, the thing you don't. And so uh, I'm not going to go into all the ways of which you should do it because it's pretty rare that I see anyone effectively use smoothing. Like if you throw out all your noise and you're left with just your signal, that's great for your customer, but you want to be explicit about what you threw out. So in some sense, you want to maybe more highlight the idea that's important and sort of uh, filter out the things that are not, but still show them. So that's, um, you still want to have that data present just to show people what the variance is that you're, you're ignoring. Right. And there's some, some explanation as the math of like, there's an actual reason about why smoothing is tricky and it's not rare, not often used. No.
if you've seen this before, I totally apologize, but I thought it was very on point. If you don't get this joke, don't raise your hand. <laughs> so <laughs> the, 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 the thing that you ran into in your homework was what I would consider missing data, right? Someone didn't get all the fields. And so sometimes you can get away with just sort of ignoring the things that aren't present. But more often, you actually need to fix those. And so there's a variety of ways in which you can do that that are meaningful. The thing that you did in the homework is none of these, right? So the rearrangement into the appropriate column, I don't even know if I'd consider that sort of a, a missing data in this, but it is sort of like the rearrangement and shuffling of data to deal with the fact that it's not there. We didn't add any new addresses. All right. I'm going to use that same loan data that we looked at earlier. And it's a really big table, right? It's like 100 and, or 148 columns and 48,000 rows. So it's a little big. Right? There's our, our, our shape. It's really big. It's cool. And so this, there's a tool that's in the notebook here that we're using to visualize the density of that data, right? So like the, yeah. So the, the black lines are the columns that are filled, and the white lines are the ones that are empty. And we can sort of like just verify that. At the beginning here, there's two white lines that we can't even tell are there. But if we go back up to our data, we look at the, the first column was NANS, and the second column was NANS. And then all of these sort of look good, right? Up to, let's see. So I, I tweaked my notebook here to show all the columns. So we're going to scroll to the right. And we'll see, as we get out to the right in our data frame, these empty values, they're all NANs, right? NAN, 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 NAN. And so what we see visually, that's hard to see. But visually, we can say all these white things, those are the empty columns. All right, so this is pretty cool because what it tells you is, look at that row. <laughs> That's like an interesting row. Maybe we should investigate that more because it has entries where most don't. This is only showing by default the first 150 rows. So it's not an exhaustive thing, but it means that there's some patterns that maybe we should be on, on the lookout for. So I found this tool pretty useful in visualizing the density of your missing values, right? So I'm going to get to, if there are columns, basically, that are all NANs, you can just throw those out, right? No information lost. Questions on that? A pretty straightforward tool that's sort of like, when you're going through your, your project, and you have all these columns, and you're like, I don't even know what the density of the sparseness is, you can use that. Yeah. So. I, my this is my personal like gut reaction. As soon as you see that everything's an and, drop that thing. Right. The more uh, tricky thing to do is sort of like fill in your nans with a fixed value. If you really do need that column to be a thing, you can just set the entire column to be uh, a single value, which may or may not be the right thing to do. Going back to Mehmet's question earlier, if there's a variable for which the distribution of shape of the uh, variable is known, you can actually use that information to say, like, I'm missing a value, but rather than sort of like picking it, I'll just like draw it from this distribution. So the, the frequency at which I draw this variable random value will be set by the distribution. It's like a, a pretty tricky thing to do. Again, you should be super explicit with the audience that that's, that's, a, that's what you've done. And going back to the point that we made about the, the diagram earlier, the fact that you're starting out with missing data may have biased the variable distribution in the first place. So heads up on that one. All right, Pandas has a super cool interpolate function. Who here can explain to me interpolation? I thought I have a pen. Maybe not. All right, we'll use a different color. Oh, there it is. Anyone want to volunteer? Oh, Emily, can you come up to the board? Oh, yeah. I have this pre-drawn diagram for you. Oh. <laughs> All 
What she's thank you very much. What she did was she used the adjacent points to fill in the missing value. That's relatively straightforward to describe, but if you had to hand code that, it'd be a health mess. So happily, there's this nice and triple A function. It even allows you to do fancy things. Like if you only wanted to say use the nearest neighbor, that's one approach, right? And so you can set the sensitivity to how many adjacent neighbors you use in that interpolation. That's, that may or may not be useful. The other trick that Pandas allows you to do is you can just copy over the most uh, the, the adjacent value. So in this case, if you wanted to say, I'm going to work from the left to the right in this case, this missing value I'll just fill in as this one. Okay, so you can, that's called filling forward or filling backward. Um, with your missing values that may or may not be applicable. If you have multiple missing values, you usually want to bound how many forward values you're filling in with that. And so like if we fill in say two forward values and the actual value is up here, we're getting farther and farther away from the truth. So you usually want to limit how far forward you extrapolate those values. And if you're interpolating, you want to limit how, much, how far out you go with your interpolation. Good. I think so. Visually, these are relatively straightforward things to do. Mathematically, doing all that work yourself would be a hell of a lot of struggle. And so it's nice to just use the, the tools once you know they exist and the concept behind them. All right. So. <laughs> There was this really good article. I highly recommend you read it if you want. Um, it's it's applying basically techniques that we've learned here in class so that you could do them um, using, for instance, paying your neighbors. And so, if every row in your see it in your in your data frame is some independent entity, then you can figure out which rows are most adjacent to each other, and then use those adjacencies to fill in the nearest of the the missing values. So in this it was clear what the nearest values were because we're on this sort of like sequential plot. But if you have, say, 50 columns of data, it's not clear what near, near, nearness means in terms of is one row like another row. And so you can actually use k nearest neighbors to figure out um, where you should fill in based on. So it's, you're still doing interpolation, but it's not in a linear set. All right. I'm read that. All right. We're almost at the end. So this is my little tip for the day. <laughs> this is how I may or may not be successful. If you can figure out what your customer wants and then do that and find another customer and satisfy them, right, and find another customer and satisfy them, you've got multiple projects going on at once. That means if one person like gets hit by a bus or like leaves, right, you've still got something to, to work on. So I would advocate work on typically two to three things at once. So that if anything goes wrong, you can still recover your career. Questions on that? I happen to be te teaching a night course at UMBC. <laughs> okay, so that's cool. And then uh, build it off. All right, so the homework for tonight, and this is stuff you'll work on, is the, the fact that I've embedded some HTML in an XML file. So that's not super surprising. What we can do is apply a beautiful soup to it and parse that HTML and figure out how many links are in each web page and then report that out in your notebook. So you'll notice we're not done with class. We ended the lecture a little earlier. So what I'm looking for, hopefully it's in here. Yeah. So I'm going to hand out some papers. And it will take about 10 minutes or so to write down on paper what it is that you would do to solve that problem. 
is if you're in front of your laptop you just start typing things right and the danger is I don't know why but that sort of like locks out some creativity so I'm advocating stretch sketch it out on paper and then tell me the story you know raise your hand and say I've got what I think is a plan of attack so yeah on the assignment so yep yeah. so imagine this is where you use your brain to figure out what would an XML file that contains HTML pages look like, and how would I parse that using Beautiful 2? Right? And so, using Google to sort of like, you know, what libraries exist or whatever, like that's fine, but I'm advocating write down your plan on paper. And there's one more activity after this before we leave, so we can do this. And this is for the people who already know how to do this and have written the code five times. This is your extra work. <laughs> Optional. So the great thing about this paper, it's free. You can start like sketching out what does XML look like and where where do you think that would, would plan? All of this is for you to start planning your attack before you've even seen the data or type any code on your computer. If you have questions or want to like flag me down, I'm available. It is all plain text, so I haven't messed with your cleanliness of video. If you're not sure what nation HTML pages, please raise your hand and I will help you more recall that. Question? Yeah, go ahead. Not sure what it is. Okay. So that's the okay. When I visit a web page, what I typically see The title, here's a pretty picture, here's some text, here's a web link, and all this good stuff. All of that is encoded using a markup language, so HTML's hypertext markup language. And so this page is represented in code as what typically looks like. Okay. 
got like tags here. Does that clarify? Yeah, there are links within a page. Yeah. yeah. So we are looking for the link or right. so how many for each page is connected to page in the page. So in so this is a the HTML of a web page, right? And there are multiple web pages embedded in the XML. Sure, like or by How do you think it looks like? You know XML well enough to know what that looks like? Okay. Want to draw it on the board? <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay. So if someone is done or not doing anything, can you explain where you're at? David? What do you got? Okay. So you have a sequential okay. So the, the whole exercise of this activity was for you to develop a set of steps that you would take in your implementation to accomplish this goal. Right. So that's the whole exercise was just to figure out what a plan of attack would be. And the plan is sort of a set of steps that you're going to take. So that may or may not be right when you're faced with the actual data, but that's where we're at. All right. I will take all the paper that you have not used or even some of you want. There's anonymous questions up here. Our last exercise, again, that all of you a couple of these. So write down on a paper one thing that you learned and another that you were not clear on. Does anyone not have one? Okay, Just one. Yeah. All right. Write down one thing that you learned. Okay. Yeah, in this class, and one thing that was not clear. And don't put your name on it. And then when you're done, you can turn it in, and you're done.
think there is time to one or That's actually the advanced version. Yeah. Like so why? This makes more sense to me than that. So I guess I don't understand why. You're saving me. Yeah. Well, if I didn't tell people to use beautiful soup, it'd be really hard. Okay. So let's say in your case, you've got a. a all right. So all you're so in some sense doing is looking for this. Not exactly. even what this says, just how many times you can How many links there are. And so the tough thing is you would need to figure out consistently where does this start and where does this end? And that's your block of thing to look within for the count. But you can this is like, embedded. Don't care how many times this happens in the docs or how many times it happens yeah. in the yeah. XML file. Okay. Yeah, sure. Now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sounds pretty straightforward. But this is in within. So this okay. is like some XML thing of like page ID, right? Yeah. Which is not an HTML thing. So, and then there's another page that goes after. And so we care about how many of the best and not how many are. I mean, yep. like, it's not the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Question. I mean, that's the thing. Right? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I just like to create the Oh. Mm, fake data or regular CSV? Uh, regular CSV. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 
hopefully this is what you're sending me. Um, I loaded the data. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I create a column mm -hmm. and up there, and then <coughs> load it. And we go down. Okay. So I use a log. Mm -hmm. So it's location, so location within a rows. So if the um this this column mm -hmm. has the um if it has a value apt, mm -hmm. then shift it. Uh, but when I did it, so yeah, you look at the, this is starting at four six yeah. twelve, so it's dropping all the rows that don't. Matter. Right, but even though I'm not using the dropping. So you are. Oh. So. So the reason is, so mm -hmm. so this is basically an argument to uh -huh. the location. So I'm going to insert a new row above that. Mm -hmm. And then, so basically this is, you know, let's, I'm going to do this piecewise. So ragged, and it's looking at the column label department. Mm -hmm. That's, oops, I need to restart for that. All right, so there's our first big. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so so ragged apartment returns what's called a series, and the series is the index uh -huh. and the entry for that right, column. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so when we apply this, so for that string, if it contains that return mm -hmm. a value, and what it, and let's just make this easy. So it's going to return a series. Yeah. So and a series. Mm -hmm. And what that series contains, though, is a bunch of true false. True false, yeah. Uh -huh. And so, what pandas does when you pass it a series containing false entries, uh -huh. it doesn't just doesn't return those. So uh, the location of that row mm -hmm. when it's false, mm -hmm. then it will drop. just drop. Yeah. Oh. So, so this is returning all of the things that have an apartment in that right, column, right. but okay. none of the things that are not. So this is usually used for filtering. So like if I only care about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. right? right. <laughs> so it's uh, useful if you want to filter. In filter. this case you didn't want to filter. Right, right. So if I didn't want to use filter, what would the option what should I do? So Honestly, I was like spending hours and hours and hours well, using <laughs> all different like stuff in there. So if I can just go back to this point. <laughs> so sometimes this Mm -hmm. I feel like this is like overused, but <laughs> you were stuck more than 30 minutes. Ask for help. Okay. Right? That's the diagram. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so for future reference. Thanks. But <laughs> um, uh, so let's, I'm gonna just pick on someone else here if I can find someone. Else. So what would be your approach to solve this problem? <laughs> so, are you gonna do just? The funny thing, I didn't have, I didn't worry about solving this problem. <laughs> I know that there are so many students here who are solving. Uh, so they just today. use the patterns, right? They yeah, use so a they regular use, expression. So, but what they were, were doing wasn't that much different than yours because what they were looking for was, does this entry, does this entry match Adam? And that's actually what you did, and so. The difference is they were using regular expressions, but you were just doing a plain string match, which actually mm -hmm. is probably what I would have done. I'm not super, mm -hmm. I try to avoid regular expressions. Okay. So, so what I would have done is um, using your approach of looking for a string, mm -hmm. the easy question is, um, well, I would just try to avoid dynamically doing data science. Let's see if I'm off. So Reagan, And then um, I was thinking about maybe the kind of like to apply the data, um, if the address. Why would you use group by? So some of it 
some of the address has a funding. Some yes. of they don't have it. Yeah. So I cannot sort of like group in them and they combine together later. Wow. So, so I think what you're saying, mm -hmm. we'll come back to this. Yeah. So what you're saying is if, so if I, if I go through these and I say, this one has a two letter string in it. So we're going to take all the things that have a two letter string in it and we'll, we'll apply the same operation of like shifting this two yeah. places mm -hmm. over. Right. And then we'll find all the things that have an apartment in the apartment column and we won't do anything to that. Right, right? Right. And we'll shift all of these by one. Right, right. I think that's what you just have. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think, that this totally would work of like you could do a group by operation of like if right. if it if the this column contains two letters and it's a state then we'll have the same operation mm -hmm. but that's basically what I'm going to do without doing a group by operation so I'm going to do that there's no I, I can't think of an advantage to doing the group by because if you just do that same operation by row mm -hmm. you get the same result right okay and so so maybe conceptually mm -hmm. you're applying the same function to all the rows mm -hmm. and I don't see an advantage of applying it like clustering it into right, all right. these rows of the same and then find operation ones. That's true. Uh, oh, there we go. If, um, and I turn. So I, I'm making a function, and the function mm -hmm. basically does your string matching. Mm -hmm. So if that apt is in, in the, row. the row apt, then. then it's going to return that string. So if there's a match, then mm -hmm. it will say, I found a match. Mm -hmm. And if there's not a match, the else statement, then it won't do anything. It won't return yeah. anything. Right. So what I'm going to do then mm -hmm. is apply that to every row. Uh -huh. So let's, why am I not looking at Yeah, drag it. If the name of your day frame is ragged, mm -hmm. so I do a ragged uh, result. Find this. So access equals one is then doing it row, one. doing it row wise. Uh, so the apply function you can apply it to every cell, all every single cell in every panda frame, uh -huh. or you can apply it every column, or you can apply it every row. Access equals zero is doing it, applying this function to mm -hmm. every column, which is access equals zero, wouldn't uh, be useful. Saying access equals one yeah, says applying this row. function per row. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm going to not be sure if this works out. But we'll try. Yeah. Um, where did that use result? Oh, I see. I have to. Mm -hmm. I'm applying this function row wise mm -hmm. to this data frame. I'm storing the result to a new column called result in that same data frame. Let's see if that works. Yeah, okay, so how do I. Okay, so the basically when let me get back to here. So I have a data frame, I'm applying this function. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you're applying the function every row. And so the row is treated as a series. And I don't like working with series. They're not like they're not the way I think. And so I convert a series into a dictionary so that so key value pairs make more mm -hmm. sense to me. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's applying it to all the rows. Do I take a bunch of time? Mm -hmm. And eventually, when it's done, it's like ragged. And so let's see. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Um, 
So when it's in, in the apartment column, mm -hmm. it was looking for the APT in that right. string. And when it finds it, it returns it's that. Here. Otherwise, if that didn't match, we do nothing. Oh, so I can do, okay. For each category, which is like the address or state. Mm -hmm. Zip code. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I will email this to you. Yeah, that will be great. So this is so, I will kind of finish it up and then see how it works. And then I can drop you know, those columns. So, so I would like call this like APT old, street old, state mm -hmm. old, zip note. And then instead of result, I would like apartment actual street yeah, actual, right? Okay. Yeah. And so the important, why spend time on this? Because this mentality of writing a function to apply to each row yeah. is really useful. Because there's typically a transformation that you want to do to a row yeah. to get back something new. Mm -hmm. This is this is it. Right, right. The apply function. Oh, it's pretty good. All right. Yeah, so I nice feel like all of the spending and this like five or six hours and using all different like functions and strategies to figure it out and yeah, and, like, that kills me. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I hear that, no. students are like, it's not that you're not. It's to me, you're not. You, Productively using yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I kind of learning, like, you know, like, oh, you're, okay. Stuff, so. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, there's some use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. All right, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In your email. Questions. <laughs> Sorry for not recognizing you were waiting. All right. All right. What can I do for you then? All right. Yeah. Why is something wrong? Like, or like this? This was intentionally difficult. Which homework are you talking about? This one. Okay. What's the question? So um, I tried to get, like, you know, including the FTC, but yeah. I still get this. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So does it, was it intentionally, like, was it way, or? Uh, so I'm not, did you need to use encoding? Um, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. That's why, I'm, I mean, I, I tried without using it. Hmm. So, so let's, let's see the content. Content is also messed up. Well, it's not messed up. That's the, the way that I can put. Oh, and what are you reading into? What? No. Uh, control. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So you're. Reading XML files? Yes. So back in the homework assignment. Yes. Uh, okay. I got it. Okay. It's a very reasonable question. All right. So I provide you an XML file. Yeah. Second step. Use a module to parse the XML. Okay, I You're not that, doing that. Not using it. You're using beautiful soup. To parse that. <laughs> then you, <laughs> this is my comedy. I did not know beautiful soup can parse XML. I hope that was I don't like XML. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I totally agree. Anyway, the weird part is like you know you put HTML in XML. Yes. That messes things. Yes. So I, I I think if we read through here, we will find that it is not parsing. So the thing here is the is? tags of the HTML okay. are basically encoded for XML, and so you have to decode. So these tags of the ampersand yeah. and the and the whatever sorry whatever the the left carrot and the right carrot are. Those are not being decoded by this XML F library. I'm going to use another library. Uh, or I mean, like, it's vertical two parsers because I get content. Yeah. Yeah. See, like, yeah, um, yeah. You, yeah. Agreed. But yeah. it's not uh, decoded. Yeah. The, the other thing is C data. There's two ways to encode tags within XML. One of them is C data. C and I don't know what the other name of the other one is. C data versus. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so so if I had used a a C data tag within the XML, yeah. Yeah, so C data is for escape text. Or like um okay, here we go. So so this is what I'm claiming is that this C data tag makes the HTML readable. Okay. But it's not that safe, and so the more proper encoding is to switch it over into this expanded format, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure what it has a name or not. But your LXML library in Beautiful Soup is not uh, transforming these back into the regular okay. HTML tag. Okay. I, I, okay. I you see what I mean? Yeah. I don't know what that's called. Though. Actually, I'm look. You know, when I'm programming, um, when I pass data. Yeah. I convert that to I, I call it that format because like you know it's safer to transfer. So yeah. Into this format. The the thing that you are encountering now. Yeah. 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 So, but I don't know what that's called. Uh, HTML like there are two encoding. One is HTML encoding, the other one is URL encoding. URL encoding? Yeah, so like if you if you're passing data through uh, yeah, URL. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like you know it's it, yep. you, know, you know, change the did you have a question? Okay. Run over. He's he's off on a different problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm not quite sure your data. Okay. So is that why I didn't clear the proposal? Uh, so what I was looking for. Can you scroll back up to where mm -hmm. your your testable hypothesis is? Um, my, so, well, I want to choose the top three reasons to affect the parking price information. Ah. Okay, so, so let's write that down. Uh, I'm looking for my blue pen. It's easier to read. Okay. Okay. This doesn't erase very well on the board. Mm -hmm. So top three, okay, top three um, factors or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's uh, what I would consider a characterization of the data. Like if you look hard enough, you will find an answer. Mm -hmm. But what I'm asking for is for you to make a prediction about what the answer should be. Oh, okay. So what so do you, what do you think the top three are? Do you have a guess? Maybe the area, like okay. some, some yeah. area is close to the school. Or, okay. Yeah. What's what's another one? Yeah. So the type of the house, like the, maybe have. If you have that as a category, you could look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then one more. So I, I will let you think about it, but mm -hmm. that's the point, right? And then you can yeah. so once you have a guess, you can go back to your data and say, mm -hmm. is that correct or not? Mm -hmm. And you may be wrong. Mm -hmm. Being wrong about the test isn't a bad thing. It just means that your guess wasn't accurate. Right? So that means you learned something. So if that I guess is not related to the uh, the score of your yeah, grade, uh, right? So the, the, that's what I was trying to say in lecture is that like you could make a hypothesis, mm -hmm. and if you're always right about your hypotheses, you're not actually making very useful guesses, mm -hmm. right? You're just stating obvious facts. Yeah. So what, if you make a guess, let's say only one of your three guesses was actually valid, mm -hmm. that means now you learned something about what the actual top three are. Because mm -hmm. if if you had just sort of like not done this part and said top three and be like. And then like it reports out three things, and you're just like, okay, that's what it is. Okay. Right, but like this is reaffirming or changing your knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So do you check my data? Do I check your data? Uh, I mean, is that is that okay? Yeah. Well, the, the the easy question is how many rows and how many columns are there, oh, and if it's a lot. I the yeah, you have enough data, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Right, because like more than a thousand rows and more than ten columns, which I think you do. Mm -hmm. My 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 concern is if you don't have enough data, 
you might not be able to conclude appropriately mm -hmm. with a bar. Like if you have three rows and five columns, you're just like, I don't know. Yeah. Not very challenging. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, that's okay. I have to turn my pen. <laughs> Break. I was my break. I was on a meditation retreat. Really? Yeah. Enjoy it? Yeah. I got you. Very useful. That's good. You also enjoy Yeah. <laughs> In positions? Yep. All, <laughs> all week with no talking. Very nice. What's that? All week with no talking. Um, there was no talking during the week. The whole week was silent. For you or? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, also, I was in a nature area, and so there was no noise. Oh. Less relevant. Yeah. Uh, for the first time in my life, I can piss someone. Okay. That's cool. And that was really nice. The weather was good then, hopefully? Yes. Sure. It was during summer. It was during summer. Sure. Yeah, we Is that your, yeah I'll take those. Yeah. Thanks. Is this useful? Which one? Uh, the review activity? Uh, I don't know. Like you redo things. I'm not sure if you're gaining knowledge them, about them or not. Like, I mean, suggestions? I mean, <laughs> they really, you know. <laughs> you would be a hard person to make suggestions for. <laughs> like, I mean, is there suggestions to use comments, like markdown? I mean, I'm not, I'm not you know, complaining or anything. You know. I mean, it's professional, so it's gonna be like, yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll make sure the class is somewhat useful to some students. I like. I will ask for your uh, recommend. Like, I will ask for a recommendation letter from you. Okay. Because like. I'm not taking 602 because I cannot take 602. Why not? It'd be boring. What's that? It'd be boring, you mean? No, 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 no. I, I wasn't allowed to take. 